Good morning, friends. We're on chapter 17. Dita spreads out her library for another morning. When she went to Hirsch's cubicle, she found him sketching out tactics for his volleyball team, which is going head-to-head -head with another teacher's team in an important game behind the hut this afternoon after lunch. Dita is not as cheerful as her boss. She has pins and needles in her legs after the lengthy morning head count. How's it going, Adita? It's a lovely morning. The sun's going to come out for a while today. You'll see. My feet are killing me, thanks to these wretched head counts. They're never ending. I hate them. Adita, Adita, blessed head count. Do you know why it takes so long? Well, because we're all still here. We haven't lost a single child since September. Do you understand? More than 5,000 people in the family camp have died from disease, starvation, or exhaustion since September. Adita sadly nods her head. But not a single child from Block 31. We're succeeding, Adita. We're doing it. Adita gives him a sad smile of victory. If only her father were there so she could tell him. She unobtrusively moves the bench with the books a few meters so she can follow Ota Keller's classes more closely. Now that her father has gone, she has to keep up her studies on her own. Keller always has something interesting to say. She studies him. His thick woolen sweater and round face, was, which suggests he was probably a chubby little boy. He's talking to the children about volcanoes. Many meters underground, the earth is on fire. Sometimes the eternal pressure creates cracks from which white-hot material rises to form volcanoes. This material is molten rock, which becomes a really hot sort of paste called lava. At the bottom of the sea, volcanic eruptions create lava cones, which ends up forming islands. That's how the islands of Hawaii, for example, were formed. Dita listens to the sounds of the lessons rising from the little groups. It's like steam heating up the inhospitable stable in which they are located and converting it into a school and she asks herself yet again why they are all still alive. Why have they allowed five-year-olds to run around here? It's the question they all ask themselves. If Dita could place her metal bowl against the wall of the logger officer's mess hall and listen, she would have the answer she's looked for so many times. SS Camp Commandant Schwarzheber, in charge of Birkenau, and Dr. Mengele, the SS captain with special responsibilities, are the only two left in the mess hall. The commandant has a bottle of apple schnapps in front of him, while the medical captain has a cup of coffee. Mengele studies the commandant with detachment, his long face and fanatical look. The medical captain does not consider himself an extremist. He's a scientist. Perhaps he doesn't want to admit to being envious of Schwarzheber's incredibly blue eyes, so unmistakably, unmistakably Aryan compared to his own, which are brown, and which, together with his darker skin, gives him a dis concertingly southern Mediterranean appearance. At school, some people made fun of him, called him a gypsy. He loved to lay them down on his dissection table and ask them to repeat their comments to him now. Vivisection is an extraordinary experience. It's like the view of a watchmaker has, a, has of a watch, but of life. He observes Schwarzhuber drinking. It's deplorable that an SS commandant with dozens of assistants at his disposal is incapable of appearing with perfectly polished boots or properly properly ironed collars. Properly ironed shirt collars. It's a sign of slackness, and it's unforgivable. He despises country bumpkins like Schwarzhuber who cut themselves when they shave, and on top of that, Schwarzhuber does something that utterly annoys Mengele. He repeats conversations they've already had, using the exact same words and the same stupid arguments. Yet again, Schwarzhuber asks Mengele why his superiors have such an ins interest in this absurd family camp, expecting the doctor to give him the usual answer. Mengele musters his patience and puts on a show of affability, while deliberately speaking as if to a small child or, a men or the mentally handicapped. You are already aware, Herr Commandant, that this camp is strategically very important to Berlin. Damn it, Herr Doctor, yes, I already know that, but I don't know why it's shown such consideration. Are we now going to set up a child care center for them as well? Have they gone mad? Do they think Auschwitz is a resort? That's what we would like a few countries that are keeping a close eye on us to think. Rumors are rife. When the International Red Cross started to request more information about our camps and asked to send inspectors, our commander-in-chief, SS Reichsfuhrer, Heinrich Himmler, was brilliant, as always. Rather than banning the visit, he encouraged them to come. We will show them what they want to see. Jewish families living together and children running around Auschwitz. Too many complications. All the work that was done, Thersindot, that was done in Thersindot, will have been useless if 
when we receive inspectors at the International Red Cross who have tracked the inhabitants of that ghetto to here, they see that what they don't want them to see. They see what we don't want them to see. We'll invite them to see the house, but we won't show them the kitchen, just the playroom, and they'll return to Geneva satisfied. To hell with the Red Cross! Who do these cowardly Swiss, who don't even have an army, think they are, telling the Third Reich what to do? Why aren't they shown the door as soon as they get here? Or even better, have them sent to me, and I'll stick them in the ovens without stopping to off in the kitchen. Mengele smiles condescendingly as he watches Schwarzhuber become more and more red in the face. He has to restrain himself from grabbing his riding crop and bringing it down on Schwarzhuber's head. No, not his crop, that's too valuable. Better yet, he would have enjoyed pulling out his gun and blowing Schwarzhuber's brains out. But Schwarzhuber is the commandant of Birkenau, even if he is a complete idiot. My dear Herr Commandant, don't underestimate the importance of the image we offer to the world and our project. We must be careful. Do you know which executive office our beloved Fuhrer first held within the Nazi party? Mengele pauses theatrically. He knows he's going to answer his own question, but he enjoys humiliating Schwarzhuber. Head of Propaganda. He talks about it in his book, Mein Kampf. Have you read it? He relishes the Commandant's worried expression. Many people, both within Germany and outside our borders, have still not understood the need to cleanse humanity genetically by eliminating racial degeneration. There are still countries that would go on alert and open up new war fronts, and we absolutely, absolutely don't want that right now. We want to be the ones who decide where and when fronts are opened. It's the same as performing an operation, my dear Commandant. You can't just cut anywhere. You have to choose the appropriate place for an incision. The war is our scalpel, and we have to handle it with precision. If you handle it like a madman, you might end up sticking it into yourself. Schwarzhuber can't stand Mengele's patronizing tone, the same one a teacher might use with a hopeless pupil. Damn it, Mengele, you talk like a politician. I'm a soldier. I have my orders and I'll carry them out. If SS Reichsfuhrer Himmler says we have to keep the family camp, so be it. But this business of a child care center, where does that fit in? Propaganda, Air Commandant. Propaganda. We're going to get these inmates to write home and tell their Jewish relatives how well they're being treated in Auschwitz. And what the devil do we care what those Jewish pigs think about how we treat them? Mengele breathes in and mentally counts to three. My dear Air Commandant, there are still many Jews out there who'll have to be brought here progressively. An animal that doesn't know it's going to the slaughterhouse allows itself to be led there much more docilely than one that knows it's going to be sacrificed and that's, thus puts up all kinds of resistance. As someone from a village, Schwarzhuber, you ought to know that. Mengele's final comment irritates Schwarzhuber. How dare you call Tutsing a village? For your information, Tutsing is considered the most beautiful town in Bavaria and all of Germany even, which means we could say in all the whole in the whole world. Of course, Sir Commandant, I completely agree. Tux, Tutsing is a marvelous town. Schwarzhuber is about to reply, but he realizes that this pedantic middle-class doctor is deliberately provoking him, and he's not going to play along. Very well, our doctor. A child center, whatever is necessary. Very well, air doctor. A child center, whatever is necessary, he roars. But I'm not going to let it cause the slightest problem or disturbance in the camp. It will be closed at the first sign of lack of discipline. Do you think that Jew who's in charge will be able to maintain discipline? Why not? He's German. Captain Mengele, how dare you say that, or repugnant Jewish dog like him belongs to our glorious German nation. Well, call him what you will, but Hirsch's file says he was born in Aiken in North Rhine, Westphalia. As far as I know, that's in Germany. Schwarzhuber gives Mengele a fiery look. Mengele can read his thoughts. His superior finds his impertinence intolerable, but Mengele is not worried because he can also detect his superior's mistrust. Schwarzhuber knows that he has to tread carefully because Mengele has powerful friends in Berlin. There's a flash of malice in his eyes as if he's licking his lips in anticipation of the moment when Mengele's lucky star will fade and Schwarzhuber can allow himself the pleasure of crushing him. But Mengele smiles affably. He knows that moment will never arrive. He's always a step ahead of these military men who in reality have understood nothing. And have no idea why they are why they are at war. Mengele does know. He's fighting to turn himself into a celebrity. First, he'll head up the DFG, the German Research Foundation, and then he'll change the course of medical history, the course of humanity. Ultimately, Joseph Mengele knows he's not a humble man. He leaves that to the weak. History will teach Mengele a lesson. 
that's the great that the greatest weakness of all is precisely that of the strong they end up believing they are invincible so the strength of the third reich is also its fr fragility believing it is indestructible it will open so many battlefronts that it will end up collapsing the planes of the allies are already starting to circle over auschwitz and the first bombardments can be heard in the distance nobody avoids weakness not even the invincible freddy hirsch it happens a few days later when the last activities of the afternoon are over and the hut starts to empty dita hurries to gather her books she wraps them up in a piece of material to protect them from the soil of, in the hidey hole and walks over to hirsch's cubicle to stow them away she wants to get back to her mother quickly to keep her company she knocks on hirsch's door and hears him giving her permission to come in she finds him as usual sitting in the cubicle's only chair but this time he isn't working on a report his arms are crossed and he's staring blankly into space something inside him has changed she accesses the wooden trap door hidden under a pile of folded blankets and fits the books into the space she works speedily so she can leave quickly without disturbing hirsch too much but as she turns around to leave she hears his voice behind her adita hirsch sounds unhurried perhaps a little tired and lacking that energy which inspires his young listeners when he gives his pep talks when she faces the athlete what she sees is a man who is unexpectedly ex exhausted you know something Maybe when this is all over, I won't go to the promised land. Tita looks at him, mystified, and Freddy smiles benevolently at her reaction. It's logical, he thinks, that she wouldn't understand. He spent years putting all his effort into explaining to young people that they should feel proud to be Jews and should prepare themselves to return to the land of Zion, where they can use the Golan Heights as a springboard to be closer to God. Look, the people here, what are they? Zionist? Anti-Zionist? Atheist? Communist? A sigh blurs his words momentarily. And who cares? If you look more carefully, all you can see is people, nothing more. Fragile, corruptible people, capable of the best and the worst. And Dita struggles to hear some of his words, which, like the earlier ones, Hirsch is addressing to himself rather than to her. Everything that was important now strikes me as insignificant. He falls silently again and gazes into space, which is what we do when we want to look inside ourselves. Dita doesn't understand a thing. She doesn't understand why a man who has fought so hard to return to the promised land has suddenly lost all interest in going there. She'd like to ask him, but he's no longer looking at her. He's not there any more. She decides to leave him alone in the labyrinth, in his labyrinth, and depart without making a sound. She'll understand later, but right at that moment, she's incapable of seeing in his heart, seeing in his change of heart, the rare moment of clarity that comes to people when they finally, when they find themselves on a cliff edge of life. From the top of the precipice, everything looks incredibly small. Dita glances at the table. The papers lying on it are in Hirsch's hands. The papers lying on it are in Hirsch's hand. But when she looks at them more carefully, she realizes they aren't reports or administrative notes, but poems. Lying on top of them like a rock that has come loose and crushed everything is a sheet of paper bearing the letterhead of the camp's command headquarters. She only has time to read one word on it, written in bold, transfer. News of the transfer has already reached the office of the registrar in the quarantine camp, Rudy Rosenberg. The six-month deadline for the September transport has been reached, and as, forecast, and as forecast on the file, the Germans are setting in motion the special treatment. That's why, as he waits anxiously for Alice to meet him at the fence, he buttons the jacket he acquired in the black market all the way to the top. He can't stop moving. The day before, he'd asked Alice for her help in carrying out the assignment— Shomulski has given him to find out exactly how many people there are in the family camp's resistance cell. The resistance operates so secretly that the collaborators themselves often don't know one another. This afternoon, Rudy has learned that even Alice herself is linked to the resistance through a friend. Shomulski says little, rarely more than half a dozen words. It's part of his technique for survival. Whenever he's asked for further explanation or someone reproaches him for his lack of speech, he replies that a criminal lawyer... A criminal lawyer friend once told him that mute people reach old age, but Rudy had found him especially bleak and moved by his anguish, couldn't avoid asking him if the signs were bad. His words, always few, always veiled, were, things are going badly. By things, he means the family camp. As on so many other occasions, what the guards in the towers see is the quarantine camp registrar and his Jewish girlfriend from the family camp walking for toward the fence, a routine to which they'd no longer pay any attention. The Germans don't distinguish between one scrawny Jewish woman dress, dressed in rags and another. That's why they don't notice that the woman approaching the fence on this particular occasion isn't Alice Monk, but her close friend, Helena Reskova. 
one of the coordinators of the family camp resistance. She's come to the fence to give Rudy the confidential information the head of the resistance has asked for. There are 33 secret members divided into two groups. Helena asks Rudy if she knows anything more about the transfer. But there's not much news to add. He's heard a rumor about a possible move to Haderbrook camp, but there are no details. The authorities are not giving anything away. They stand looking at each other for a while without speaking. The girl might have been pretty under other circumstances, but her dirty, tangled hair, sunken cheeks, chapped lips, and filthy clothes have turned her into a 21-year-old beggar. Rosenberg, normally so chatty, has no idea what to say to this girl who has a battered present and a dark future. He receives permission that afternoon to go to Camp B2D, supposedly to take over some list, but in reality to meet Shmulewski. Shmul Shmul he finds him sitting on a wooden bench in front of his hut, chewing on a twig in the absence of any tobacco. Rudy, who always works things out so well, he's, so he's well stocked with everything, offers him a cigarette. He passes on Helena's information about the number and basic occup occupations of the insurgents in the family camp which Shemulski acknowledges solely with a nod of his head. Rudy hopes to get some sort of explanation out of the situation, but he gets nothing. Pretending that Shemulski doesn't already know, he tells him that it's March 6th, and so they're getting close to the six-month deadline since the arrival of Alice's September contingent, when the special treatment kicks in. I'd prefer it if that moment never arrived. Shemulski smokes his cigarette without saying a word. Rosenberg gathers that the meeting is over and mumbles an awkward goodbye. He returns to his camp, not sure if the pole's silence is because he has crucial information to hide or because he has absolutely no idea what is going on. The afternoon roll call takes longer than usual. Various SS soldiers notify all the capos that the inmates should line up at the entrance to the camp. Waiting there for them are the camp capo, the civilian responsible for B2B, an ordinary German prisoner called Willie, and the non-commissioned officer they call the priest, flanked by two guards with machine guns at the ready. The inmates watch as the heads of all the barracks start walking toward the non-commissioned SS officer and form a half-circle around him. Freddy Hirsch strides, strides energetically across the Lagerstrasse, overtaking other capos who are less keen to get to the meeting. Night is falling, but it's easy to distinguish Hirsch's proud and self-assured figure making his way there. The priest is waiting for them, with his hands tucked inside the sleeves of his great coat. He watches them arriving with a cynical smile. It's obvious he's in a good mood. Good news for the sergeant that he's getting rid of many of the inmates. Half the prisoners means half the problems. An assistant hands the capo's list, which the numbers of the people in their huts from, from the September transport. The capos must inform them that they are to line up separately next morning and bring with them their belongings, their spoon and bowl, in order to proceed with the transfer to another camp. Only one person sleeps in Block 31, the blocker, blocker tester himself, and he accepts the shortest list of all. It is just one number on it, his own. In the midst of the silence, interrupted only by the rustle of paper lists, he is the only one who dares to make his way forward and stand at attention in front of the sergeant. Permission to speak, Herr Oberscherfuhrer. Would we be able to know to which camp we're being transferred? The priest stares at Hirsch for a few seconds without blinking, asking a question without being asked to speak first as an act of contempt that the NCO normally doesn't tolerate. On this occasion, however, he limits himself to giving a sharp reply. You'll be informed when it happens. Dismissed. The capos stand in front of their huts and start to yell up 